Hi and welcome to this tutorial on the reactions of group 2 elements. In the previous tutorial we learnt about group 2 elements, about the trend in their ionisation energies, their radii and their reactivity as we move down the group. In this tutorial we're going to be looking at the reactions of the group 2 elements, the polarising power trends and their solubility trends too. So we know the group 2 metals readily react with oxygen to form metal oxides. So if we let M represent any group 2 element, so we're going to have the metal, we're going to have M, my group 2 element, reacting fully with oxygen, and obviously that's going to be gases, oxygen, my metal's going to be solid, and we're going to make a metal oxide. And because we're in group 2, it's going to need to be MO, and then we're going to balance accordingly. So if I've got two oxygens there, then I'm going to put a 2 in front of here, then I'm just going to put a 2 over here. So we've got a group 2, group 2 element, plus oxygen is going to make a metal oxide. Different group 2 metals also burn with different coloured flames when you react them with oxygen, and this can be used to test for the presence of 2 plus ions. Now, this is on some specifications and not on others, so double check whether you need to learn flame tests or not. So having a look at this, beryllium is going to have the colour flame white, as is magnesium. Now, magnesium is an easy one to remember because I remember when I was very young, the teacher used to tell me that you had to look away because it burns so brightly with such a bright white. And then we've got brick red from calcium. We've got scarlet from strontium and barium, we would call it apple green. Group two elements also react readily with water to form metal hydroxides and hydrogen. So it's an important reaction that we need to know. So again, if we let M represent any group two metal, I'm going to react it with water. That's going to be liquid. This is going to be a solid. And we're going to make a hydroxide. Now it's a group two, so it's going to have to be MOH2. We need two of those. And we're making hydrogen. That's going to be, well, I'm going to put aqueous here, but actually it depends on the metal as to how soluble it is. And then I'm going to balance it. And all I need to do is put a two in front of that H2O and it's balanced. So we're getting a group two metal plus water is always going to give us a metal hydroxide and hydrogen. So it's a redox reaction, this, because the group two elements are oxidised from an oxidation state of zero to plus two, and the hydrogen is reduced from plus one to zero. Let's give an example then of calcium in water. So I've got calcium I'm reacting with H2O to give me calcium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. And I'm going to balance it out there. So I can see that calcium has gone from oxidation state of zero because it's an uncombined element by itself to plus two. It's group two, so it's always going to have an oxidation of plus two when it's in a compound. And my hydrogen has gone from plus one because it's not an exception for hydrogen, so it's just going to be the ion that it forms, to zero, an uncombined element. So calcium has been oxidised, because its oxidation number has gone up. It has lost electrons. What happens to the reactivity with water, then, as we move down group two? So if we move down, we're going to say the reactivity with water increases. So the rate of reactivity with water with the elements increases. So beryllium is not very reactive at all. Magnesium is a very, very slow reaction, but barium reacts very rapidly. Of course, the resulting hydroxide solution, if it's soluble, so it dissolves in the water, it's going to give an alkaline solution. Hydroxides are alkaline because the hydroxide is going to dissociate. So if we have our calcium hydroxide, if that was to dissociate, we'd end up with Ca2 plus and two OH minus polyatomic ions. Now this in the solution is going to be alkaline and to lead to an increase in the pH, as you can see here. Our group two metals also react vigorously with steam to form metal oxides and hydrogen. So let's 
give an example. So I've got my metal there. Reacting with water, it's going to create my metal oxide and hydrogen. So we've got a group two with water in terms of steam. So I'm going to put gaseous there. We've got a metal oxide and hydrogen. And I should really put metal oxide is going to be solid and hydrogen is obviously gaseous. And then oxides of group two metals. So if we start with a metal oxide, that's going to react with water, so liquid water. And it's going to form a metal hydroxide as well. So we've got aqueous and it's just going to be a metal hydroxide. So I can also say that I've got group two plus water is going to make a metal hydroxide. And group two elements, so if we just have M by itself, solid M, can react with dilute acids like hydrochloric acid. And they're going to make a salt, which is going to dissociate in water, so it'll be aqueous, and hydrogen. So we've got a group two plus acid makes a metal salt and hydrogen. Of course, the salt made depends on the acid used. So if we react the metal element with hydrochloric acid, we're going to make a chloride um, and we're going to make a nitrate or a sulfate. We've got a few more to go. So if we're talking about group two metal oxides, they're able to react with dilute acid. So acid that's aqueous to make a salt and water. So we've got that option as well. And then we've also got our group two elements reacting or our group two hydroxides, I mean. So group two hydroxide can also react with dilute acids. So acid, if I say that's aqueous, and that's going to create a salt and it'll end up being two H2O in terms of how it balances water. And then we've finally got the carbonates. So MCO3 can react with acid. And that's going to make a salt plus carbon dioxide plus hydrogen. We also need to know about the polarizing power of the group two elements. So ion polarization is when a cation distorts the electron cloud of a neighboring anion by attracting the delocalized electrons towards it. So the polarizing power of the cation depends on two main things, ionic radius and charge size. So if we look on the left hand side, we can see we've got a small ionic radius. Now, it's really important you don't refer to it as an atomic radius in the exam question if it's an ion. You have to use the correct term. This is an ionic, ionic radius that we're talking about. And comparatively, it's got a large charge because it's three compared to the one on the right-hand side. So this means it's got a high charge density. Okay, so those charges, they're high and they're able to pack closely together because the radius is smaller. And this leads to a high polarizing power. Now, if this was comparing two things, we need to use comparative language. So I'd need to say higher, higher, larger, smaller. So that's really, really important exam technique. On the other side, we've got a larger ionic radius, of course. And we've got a smaller charge in comparison to the ion we've got on the left. So we've got a lower charge density. So they cannot pack as closely together. So we've got a lower polarizing power. Carbonates of group two elements, they can decompose upon heating with oxygen. And I've got an example here. So if I have my metal carbonate, that's always going to be a solid. And if I heat it, it's going to decompose into the metal oxide and carbon dioxide. So we're going to have a group two carbonate is always going to give uh, our metal oxide and carbon dioxide. 
The thermal stability of the group two carbonates is going to increase as you go down the group. So what this means is that the temperature or the energy required in order to decompose that carbonate increases as we move down group two. So what can we say about this? So as we move down the group, we've got ionic radius that is going to be increasing. We've got charge density increases and we've got polarizing power increases. So if I've got a carbonate and I've got my metal ion over here, we can see in terms of me drawing an electron cloud, we've got a much greater density here than we do further around. So we can say that the delocalized electrons are pulled towards positive ion. So they're pulled towards here. And this end of the ion is on its way to breaking away and becoming CO2 rather than CO3. So this oxygen atom is well on the way to becoming an oxide ion. So the nitrates of group two elements, they decompose upon heating to give the metal oxide, nitrogen four oxide and oxygen. So check whether this is one that you need to know on your specification. So if we've got our MNO3, we're gonna need two of those within group two. We're gonna end up with a metal oxide. We're gonna end up with this and this, and then I can balance accordingly. So I'm going to need to put, so if I put a two in front of here, then I want to put a two in front of here and a four in front of here and it's balanced. So if we've got a nitrate of group two, we're going to get an oxide plus nitrogen four and then oxygen. The thermal stability of the group two metal nitrates also increases as we move down the group. Therefore, the temperature or the energy required to decompose that increases. And again, this is due to the polarizing power of the metal cation as we go down group two. And then finally, we're looking at the trends in solubility. So we're going to look at hydroxides, sulfates and the test for sulfates as well. If a group two compound consists of negative ions that have a single charge such as OH minus... The solubility of these compounds in water is going to increase as you move down the group. So, for example, magnesium hydroxide is sparingly soluble in water, whereas barium hydroxide is very soluble in water. As we go down group two, the solubility of compounds containing doubly charged negative ions decreases. So, if a group two compound consists of negative ions that have a double charge, such as SO4 2 minus the sulfate polyatomic ion, the solubility of these compounds in water decreases as we move down the group. Okay, so if we look at reactions with calcium oxide, so calcium oxide 2H2O plus SO2 is going to give us our calcium sulfate plus 2H2O. And then if we react with calcium carbonate, CO3, 2H2O plus SO2, we're going to get plus 2H2O plus CO2. 
Barium sulfate is insoluble in water. So it's almost the opposite way around. Barium hydroxide is very soluble in water. Barium sulfate is not. It's insoluble. It doesn't dissolve in water. Instead, it forms a white precipitate. And this is really helpful for qualitative testing for sulfate ions. So acidified barium chloride can be used or anything as long as we put barium ions into the solution to test for sulfate. And we will get a white precipitate of barium sulfate formed when we add it. So when we see that reaction happening, we are adding barium to a solution that has sulfate ions in it. So we're going to get barium sulfate formed. And that is a solid, it's a white precipitate. That'll be a positive test. And if we look at that in terms of an actual reaction, so if we add barium chloride to a solution of zinc sulfate, now obviously that's aqueous, so the ions are going to be separated then we're going to see that displacement happening where barium sulfate is going to form, and that's a solid, and we're going to be left with the zinc salt, and that's still going to be aqueous. So that would give us a positive test result of a white precipitate, and that would tell us that there's sulfate ions present in that solution.